once again to the Jaipur Literature Festival 2023. We are delighted to introduce Women and Work. This session is presented by UN Women. We have a very distinguished panel for this. A woman's work is never done. Women's participation in the workforce is decreasing steadily. Even as the figures rise in the rest of the world, a deep discussion on women and work with anecdotal insights and perspectives to analyze current realities and ponder how to understand, respect and revive the role of women in economic sphere. A panel of women from diverse backgrounds discuss the causes and consequences of the roadblocks that have come up in the way of working women's working life in the past present and likely to be in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite on the stage Shelly Chopra, Mini Ved, and Lakshmi Puri. These three people are in conversation with Suzanne Ferguson. Please give them a big hand. Shelly Chopra is a game changer in India's digital revolution with women-oriented digital spaces including shethepeople.tv and gaitree.com, India's first women's health platform addressing hormonal needs and changes across cycles. She is the author of Sisterhood Economy and is a Stanford Draper Hills and Aspen Fellow and recipient of the RNG Award. Mini Vaid is a journalist, documentary filmmaker, author, researcher, television professional, and creative producer for feature films in India. She has written four non-fiction books on human rights activists, people's struggles, activism, and Isro's women's scientists. Her fifth book, Fateh, is her first narrative fiction, a story of women empowerment in a male-dominated profession, that is, the army. <laughs> Lakshmi Puri is a former IFS officer and ambassador. She is a distinguished fellow of the Indian Association of International Studies, IAIS, and recipient of prestigious Eleanor Roosevelt Prize for Human Rights. Puri is also a published author of several reports and research papers. Suzanne Ferguson is the country representative for UN Women India. She has had a distinguished career in the international development spanned by themes of gender equality and social justice. She has extensive experience working in the grassroots level of developmental agencies. So Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. Hello? Now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction and thank you very much for our panelists in joining me here today. It's really a great pleasure to be here. My first time in Jaipur Literature Fest Literary Festival. It's wonderful. So we're here today um, to talk about women's economic empowerment and also lack of at times. So we know actually the, the stats are pretty dismal. There's some bright spots, but recently UN Women did um, some research looking at gender equality across all the SDGs. And we found that it's, if the situation remains the same, it will take nearly 300 years to reach equality in legislation across the world. It'll take over 120 years for equality in economic justice, and it will take 40 years for parity in politics. So I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed some of, the, um, some of the gains that were made previously. And we're here today really to talk about um, some of the barriers for women in, um, in economic justice. And Shelley, I'm gonna start with you 
And um, perhaps you can throw some light on the falling labour force participation rate. Globally, it's remained stagnant, and in India, it is falling. What are some of the barriers and the issues that women face in the economic life of the country? Susan, thanks very much, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's always hard to be the session after lunch. <laughs> so thank you for coming out. Um, you said throw some light on why women numbers are dwindling in the workforce. When we are growing up, we are asked, why do you want to work? Why do women want to work? It sounds like a question that should have a very big essay style answer. I have ambition, I want to work. I, I choose to make a choice, so I want to work. Then they say, you want money? Take my money. Take your daddy's money, take your brother's money, your mama's money. There's enough money. You don't need your money. And I say, no, we need our own money. It's not money. It's our own money. And I think half the time, when we look at these numbers, one of the big things that we forget to see is that, why is this happening? And then we look for more numbers to justify why, because statistics help justify another set of numbers. And I think that's fundamentally the problem, because we've gone down now at below 25% of the female workforce. You know what that means? That means that our mums are raising us to believe that we are lesser human beings. We are at workplaces where they tell us that if you get pregnant, you're going to be off the radar for some time. You won't get your career choices because you're a woman. This is a place that's very hard for you. Why don't you take the softer side of your job? And I really think that this is the fundamental issue that we think economics has economic answers. They don't. Um, in my book, which you'll hear about later and you'll see in the store, uh, Sisterhood Economy, I call it Sisterhood Economy because I highlight why non-economic factors lead us to where we are today. Have you all heard of female pleasure? Somebody's laughing, but I'd like to hear whether you've heard of female pleasure. Have you ever thought that it could have economic impact on a woman's life, on her agency? Agency or our bodies, could that have an economic impact? Could we produce far better GDP in this country if we let women have freedom over choices, over their own bodies? Does that sound like an economic argument to you? Actually, it should. I, yes, because that's what's going to help us stand up on our feet and say, you know what? I'm a woman of my own decisions. And that's why I feel that when we talk of these numbers, let's go beyond them. Let's go into our homes. Let's go into our workplaces. Let's see how our colleagues behave with us, what our policies tell us. And then these numbers will suddenly look so different to us. And the potential of where these numbers can go could be tremendous. I'll leave you with one statistic since Susan started some. Uh, and especially these statistics are for the men. I think they love numbers, so I'd like to give it to them. Uh, we're 50% of the Indian population, right? That's 750 million. At 750 million, we're twice the size of the United States, three times the size of Brazil, and eight times the size of Japan. We're still Indian women. We're a tenth of the world's population. I'm still talking Indian women. And we call ourselves a number. Are we not a force? When will we start telling ourselves that? That's when that number of 25% will start notching up. Thank you. That's fantastic. And, um, and just to add to that, uh, you know, there's been research done by the McKinsey Institute that says that if we unlock that potential you're talking about, it will add $28 trillion worth of growth to the world. So we are indeed an economic force. Um, so, Madam Puri, I'm going to turn to you because I think that Shelley talked around uh, some of the social norms that underlie some of the barriers that women face. What's your view of these things? Thank you. Susan, and uh, I would like to start by paying tribute to Kamla Bhaseen and what she said about gender equality and discrimination. She said, and I want to say it in Hindi because I see that we have young people here, 
mostly women but also i see some good men the he for she is uh so um what i want to say is kudrat bhed banati hai lekin bhed bhav nahi so that that is the key issue here and nowhere is that bhed bhav or discrimination difference should not mean discrimination and nowhere is that discrimination more palpable more normalized than in the world of work and today i want to take up uh, both the shibolets the myths that give rise to one aspect of women and work and that is unpaid care and unpaid domestic work that women and girls are thought to be you know it's it's something considered normal for them to do something uh, that is their duty so what are those shibolets first and foremost uh, that women's place is in the home the second which it is not women's place is every place okay and that's also related to the work related uh, biases that you find the second is that women have a biological duty to do child care of course give birth but also child care and also elderly care so the care responsibility disproportionately falls on women and globally women do 2.9% more uh, um, uh, 2.9 times more work uh, at at home domestic and care work than uh, men but in india it is nearly 10% so this is another marker for us to see where is the bhed bhav taking us the third aspect is that women's work at home is not recognized it's not valued as work and i'll come to that a little later when i'm talking about sdg 5.4 but it's not valued at work uh, as work and also it is seen as duty it's seen as something they do out of love so there is no compensation due nothing that even you know says thank you because you know this is something that they have to do and the value as i know that you have done some calculations in un women the value of this is tremendous it has been calculated that 15% of the gdp should be added to the gdp of asia pacific countries if you take into account the work that women do at home so that is what we are missing out on so um the other th distortions in labor markets then as a result of this because it's not only an issue of women being uh, bearing the disproportionate share of or the lioness's share of uh, uh, domestic and care work it has an impact in the workplace itself in workforce participation there is a supply and demand impact there are distortions that come in and it uh, it impacts the decisions that women take at entry at exit and this whole pipeline from education skill to employment and then again and uh, recruitment uh, retention reentry promotion leadership that whole pipeline or value chain you may call it that gets distorted because of this consideration particularly young women of childbearing age are opting out 
of this market and they are doing so also because uh, in spite of the fact that in India now and that's a very positive thing positive trend that more women are going into higher education than men 27 percent against 25 percent so that's where we really need to uh, you know take a look at this whole issue of care work thank you so much for adding and explaining so clearly actually the impact of these social norms around women's care work and also highlighting and here many i'm going to come to you highlighting the job segregation as well you know in the labor force it's not just that women are more corralled into in informal work but also within the formal sector often they're in lower paid jobs and less of the science technology engineering and mathematical type jobs and you've written a wonderful book about this and thank i you. love the title of it as well yeah, and you. i i'd love to hear what these women said to you their experience was okay uh, first of all it's great to be here uh, at this festival so uh, the first thing that the women scientists told me, women scientists of ISRO told me, don't call us women scientists. We are all scientists. Yes. Under the, black, in a, the white uh, lab coat, we are all scientists. Please don't tag us as women scientists. Um, but having said that, there are um, less than 20% women scientists in ISRO. And given that there are 16,000 scientists in the organization, uh, in the last 53 years, if you have only 16%, I mean, I have a whole laundry list of statistics, which I'm not going to sort of bore you with. Uh, but yeah, they, there is just 16%. And there is nobody at who's a center director, uh, a, a sort of chairperson who's a woman, I think, uh, I, I doubt I'll see it in my lifetime. I hope it'll come in yours, some of the younger girls here. Um, because the reason that they give is... Um, also valid to a certain extent that um, when uh, say maybe 30 years ago much fewer women joined ISRO and because it's a hierarchical organization you have to put in the years and then you can reach uh, you know like maybe a deputy director level so that is why uh, you know you, uh, you, you uh, at that time because there were fewer women uh, there are fewer women who are uh, center directors but now in the last 20 years because a lot more women have joined you do have people who are uh, uh, mission directors like one of the people i interviewed uh, in the book ritu karidhal uh, was mission director of chandrayaan 2 uh, nandini harinath another uh, person who's deputy director of his track now um, is also a mission director for another uh, for another mission so these people have uh, reached positions uh, of, of you know some uh, importance but uh, the funny thing though is that when I when I first started the book there is no data available yeah so <laughs> if you want to know how many women joined this row like uh, in the 1980s versus how many joined today they don't consider it valuable enough to even collate and and give you that information there is just no data the other thing that I found uh, very, uh, uh, you know, sort of unusual was the women themselves. So here I'm talking about women who've sent a rocket to Mars, the most uh, difficult, precise and, you know, um, uh, nerve wracking thing that, uh, that a woman could do. Uh, so she's describing the process, uh, you know, we did this and we had to do it at this particular time, otherwise the next turn was four years later, it would have cost so many crore rupees, etc, etc. And in the same breath saying, I'm so grateful my family supported me. I'm so grateful my husband supported me. I'm so grateful my mother-in-law took care of my kids, all of which is valid and good, I'm not saying no. But what is this word allowed? I mean, you sent a rocket to Mars, why should you be allowed? To, to, you know, do that. So that I found uh, <laughs> strange. Uh, the other thing was, um, uh, you know, it's so unconscious, the bias is so unconscious uh, that uh, there was a, a top scientist, she's retired now and I'm not naming names, uh, told me that, uh, you know, my boss told me one day, uh, I, I was like going somewhere in the office, um, so and so, scientist, minus the name, I've never treated you as a woman. And I told him, sir, 
I have never behaved like a woman. You asked me to go to uh, Ahmedabad or Bangalore in uh, by six o'clock. I was there at six o'clock. I didn't behave like a woman. She wasn't even conscious of what she was saying, and you know that. So I think the gender bias, the conditioning, everything starts much earlier, where you are told science is not for girls. Your role models in your textbooks: the doctor is a man, the nurse is a woman. Uh, you know, even even in the home, your your the girl is supposed to sort of help the mother. The boy is watching TV or whatever the equivalent was in our time. So that kind of conditioning, stereotyping, I think those attitudes uh, need to change, and that is why I wanted to write uh, uh, this book not just to celebrate the Mangalyan women. Because that, of course, is an obvious achievement. Yeah, before Mangalyan, how many of y'all had heard of any ISRO woman scientist? Anybody? Name one. Name one. Nobody. And even now, after they have done such great work, and then also Chandrayaan, and the person who is going to uh, uh, be part uh, mission director of Gagan Gaganyan is also Lalita Ambika. So she was a lady. So there are many examples now. But before uh, almost uh, 45 years of ISRO, they, there was there was silence. They, they were just never talked about. And the reason that I wanted to uh, you know write this book and is to shine a torch and say here are the icons, here are the people that that uh, have made it big despite all these you know biases and you know STEM and okay so you can't science is not for girls kind of uh, stuff. And therefore, and the other thing is that uh, a lot of these women scientists come from small places. It's not that they were recruited from the fancy IITs or ISC Bangalore or others. They came from smaller places. Even recently, there was a story um, uh, about a, about a, uh, a mission director who stood on the podium and, and spoke out for the first time. And her father was a telephone assistant uh, in a small village in Tamil Nadu. So it's aspirational because people reading about this or um, not necessarily my book but just being aware of uh, the fact that such women exist have become mission directors have sent rockets to mars and then also uh, you know uh, to chandrayaan gaganyaan gives hope to everybody every girl in every village small town city who who was told science is not for you or uh, uh, you know the gap that happens up, uh, if you must have noticed 10 standard 12 standard girls do very well even in college, they do very well. And then what happens after that? They just drop out. Because that, okay, marriage, mommy track, and so, you know, your promotion, maternity leave, there, and there are schemes by the government of, you know, like break the break and all, but how effective is it? So that is why this book that, okay, if they can do it, all of you can. Thank you. So, uh, Shelley, just continuing on this idea of of a change of norms, um, you know, women aren't always seen as leaders in people's psyches. So your book, which is about you know sisterhood and um, and and what we can collectively do to change things, what do you think women's leadership can do to turn around some of these um, these statistics that we've been talking about and the situation for women in work? Thanks, Susan. You know, I think. Um I have great admiration for the women who have uh, sent rockets. But I just want to say one thing. And you know, they're amazing role models. You don't have to send rockets to be an achiever. And I say that for women who are every day put against this benchmark. And it, I mean, this is just taking away from where you started. That if you have to achieve, you know, you have to win an X prize. You have to be a CEO. And if you have to be, you know, the best selling author, I just feel we put ourselves up against the idea of leadership, and that's why it's flawed. Because we see it's something that's on the front page of a magazine. To me, every woman, every woman, as I suppose every man, every human, at some level is a leader. We don't give ourselves that chance to believe that we are leading in what we're doing every single day. I mean, that person sitting right there, nodding with another woman who's a complete stranger, they're actually building the sisterhood. They can feel each other's inspiration. And we don't give us that opportunity to say you can do this without necessarily, you know, in the eyes of the world, launching a big story, launching the rockets, leading a company and all of that. So please give yourself a chance without thinking about such big ambitions. 
dream as big as you want to, but every day you are achieving. And I think that's a big enough reason to put, you know, sort of give a pat on your back. Um, but talking of leadership, we have been fed this constantly that a woman is a woman's enemy. And that's why when I started writing this book, I said, you know what? We are not constantly reminding ourselves that we, this is not a fight amongst women. This isn't a fight uh, of men against women and a wim women against men. We're all fighting a system which is collectively called patriarchy. The more we think of that, the more we recognize that, it just reminds us that what we are against are issues. We are against the fact that we won't be looked at as people who want to make choices of their own freedom. And the minute we start doing that, the idea of leadership, the idea of access, the idea of inspiration completely changes. So, I mean, you know, you, you talked about how I set up She the People earlier in the introduction. One of the big lessons I learned, by the way, and I made my errors. The first three months, I went around with the camera interviewing what they define as achievers. And then I came back and I said, you look like every other magazine putting the same people on the front page for the last decade. How are you different? So I got the team together and I said, let us all have a conversation about what we go through. What is our everyday struggle? And I realized we were connecting and relating because we were feeling this about each other's journeys. The same struggles, what they call on Instagram as hard relate. That's exactly what was going on. And that's when the stories of real women started emerging. So I think the idea of leadership is up for a serious rejig. We need to see real women going through real struggles. Jacinda Arden, what an amazing story. What's going on around her, her authenticity to come up and say, I'm sorry, but it didn't work for me. And at the same time, making us think, how big a tank do we need to have? How much more can we have? And then BBC had the guts to put out a story that said, women really can't have it all. I'm like, come on, you know, like, what were you thinking? And we needed somebody like the BBC to say that about a woman who's like really done everything to put herself out there and make us feel that I can be the prime minister if I want to without necessarily perhaps having all that money backing and going on a Rath Yatra or whatever that takes. We need a change. Thank you. Yeah, and I think such pertinent comments about, you know, what is leadership really? And that we, there are different and new models of leadership, including collective leadership. You know, it doesn't just have to be one single person. So, and just speaking about leadership, Minnie, just coming back to you again um, around, you know, what did these scientists say uh, was their journey? You know, how did they overcome some of the barriers that they faced? So I guess, what, is, what was their model of leadership? Uh, the older women in the organization, a lot of it was the mentoring. That's what they said. They were mentored by the older scientists who'd gone the same path. And just to uh, reply for one second to uh, uh, Shaili, it's not that everybody uh, ought to sort of send a rocket to Mars. It's the fact that it's an aspiration that was earlier denied to yeah. us, denied yeah. to girls. So uh, if you're going to break the grass ceiling and then do it in a male-dominated world where you're 16%, of the uh, uh, you know the scientist workforce, then yes, it, it is aspirational. So that's just as a rejoinder. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So they said that uh, the mentors help them a lot. And uh, other than that, see, in terms of uh, economic parity, it's a central government organization. So the scales are your you know the pay grades are are all linked. So if you're a you know a level 14 um, uh, person scientist, you will get a salary equivalent to a joint secretary. That there is no uh, disparity uh, in that sense but women scientists are not represented in conferences uh, or in, in, in committees or you have the old boys network and you don't get enough fellowships so breaking that old boys network yeah. is what they said was the toughest thing mm. yeah thank you um and uh, i'm just checking the time and um ambassador you, you know, you raised the social norms and the context of caring responsibilities. Um, and there are, although there are many difficulties women face around this, there are also opportunities in this yes. care work. Yeah. Can you sort of outline some of those for us? So uh, before I do that, I think I want to pick up just one point that came, comes through in both of your... Uh, um, uh, you know, both of your very passionate uh, advocacy. And that is 
that there should be no occupational glass walls. Yes, yes, yes. Just Absolutely. as there should be, yes. that we should be able to break glass ceilings. That's what is yeah. leadership Absolutely. about. Absolutely. So that's what I wanted to say. And then coming back to this whole issue of the care economy. So when we were, when UN Women was pushing the Sustainable Development Goal 5 in uh, New York, when the UN was negotiating these what are called Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs, we insisted on inserting, and it was a difficult call because the delegates, many of them men, were not buying into that. We insisted on inserting a target on, uh, which is the goal, SDG 5, is about gender achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. And within that, there is a target which specifically calls upon or commits governments to recognize value unpaid care and domestic work that women do to share to have burden sharing in the family and also provision of infrastructure public provision of infrastructure and services and social protection so that was and in that spirit therefore what many governments have done and i know that even government of india and i know un women is working on that uh, has set up these in every district uh, these creches for children and uh, the, you mentioned the uh, maternity leave uh, 26 weeks all of that but that's of course not going to be enough what we need are the following Firstly, we need to have a kind of uh, a, a comprehensive and holistic approach to the whole issue of care work where we talk about uh, reducing the burden, sharing the burden, provisioning care work on one side, but also the uh, seeing care economy as a whole and care economy includes child care, elderly care, domestic work, cleaning, um, uh, you can uh, personal, uh, personal and wellness care and health care. That whole universe of care, if you treat it as a holistic uh, and develop a high quality skills based model on that, it would generate what we had uh, actually um, uh, estimated, it would generate a billion jobs for both men and women. Because right now, most of these jobs are taken up by women. And they are in the informal sector. And I don't want to go into that whole area of definition. But they are mostly pre uh, precarious. They are not so well paid. And, uh, and, and the wages are lower. So we now need to change that whole. So we, I think uh, UN Women has developed some kind of a uh, care compact whereby they are asking that countries invest in developing uh, such a care economy that there should be recognition, the five R's, right? So there should be recognition that there should be also um, uh, the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, um, the, the recognition, the um, investment, as I already mentioned. And there should be uh, a whole uh, ecosystem that should be set up uh, for the care economy to be uh, serving the interests of both men and women in the area of care, both and also employment generation, decent work, and breaking all those barriers that you mentioned to leadership uh, and occupational ba barriers. Because again, there is a kind of ghettoization of care work where women are, you know, concentrated there. And I would like to end with uh, two things. One is a beautiful quote 
from what we are aiming for, which is a quote from um, Virginia Woolf. And she says, anything may happen when womanhood has ceased to be a protected occupation. So this is something that must resonate with us. And then, of course, I also want to end with Kamla Bhaseen. And this is specially for the men here, because when I went to one of these early events on Swachh Bharat, I heard Prime Minister Modi say something wonderful. He said, why should cleanliness in the home be just the responsibility of the mother? Each one of you, the men in the house, they must do housework. They must do cleaning. So there is the first message is change the men, change your mindset that ye ladkiyon ka aur aur aurton ka kaam hai isme hamara koi nahi hai we are you know outside and we are the breadwinners no there is a total mindset change and kamla bhaseen said that agar mardon ke bacche ho to badal ke dikhao Thank you. Susan, I can see that you, both of you are dying to, to make a comment. No, I, I don't want to make a point per se. I just want to say something that, uh, you know, Lakshmi said that there's this tendency for us all to believe that women need to be empowered, that somebody's going to stand up and empower them. We don't need anybody to empower Absolutely. us. We'll figure this out on our own. You do your bit and everything will get sorted. I just wanted to add that. Thank you. And there's a quote by Vera Rubin, uh, who's a famous astronomer, who said, there is nothing in science that a man can do that a woman cannot do. Thank you. And thank you so much. It's really inspiring. Um, but now we have 10 minutes. If there's any questions in the audience, we'd be happy to take them. How do we manage that? Um, well, I saw your hand up first. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Oh. Sure. We'll take yeah. you and then you. Uh, all right. So I, uh, great thoughts by everyone. And I was thinking a lot about the boys club thing that you mentioned. And it was just an observation, but also a question. So earlier today, I attended two sessions. One was about uh, tech morality. The other one was about the future of work. Mm. All the panelists in both these sessions were men. The third one about women and work, everyone's a woman. Yeah. And I'm just honestly a <laughs> bit disappointed. I I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. I agree, agree. <laughs> so yeah, I'd love to hear, like, how are we going to change things if institutionally or like even where we are today, um, we are seeing this happen around us. What is the message we are giving? I'll tell you, there's a very, in, uh, one of the scientists who spoke to me recently talked about a very telling photograph at an international conference and really visual speaks so much better than words, a photograph of some 20 men yeah. and one woman, uh -huh. scientists, let that sink in. Yeah. Well, uh, well, what I would like to say is JLF has been quite fair in not having manals. <laughs> huh? So, I don't know how that, that one slipped them past. They have tried to have at least one woman <laughs> on every panel. But yes, I agree that we should not be in echo chambers, women talking to women. We need to have the men stand up and champion our cause. They may not be patronizing, as <laughs> Shelley said, but they have to stand up for us. And for that, they need to be our advocates and they need to listen to us. So, of course, there is both that side. I'm Maybe we can say a good word for all the men in the audience. Thank yes. you for coming. Very good. Yes. 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 Pass, pass yes. this forward. 
Yeah, um, and I think it's important not to take women's leadership yes. away as well. Yes. You know, so I mean, if you yes. look at all the panels, I bet you anything yes. there's still more men here than women. So we're yes. doing our bit in trying to equalize that a little as well. Yeah. So next question. Yeah. So actually, we were talking about economy. So my question was that household work, irrespective of any gender doing it, is not quantifiable in nature and thus is not added in the GDP. As you have well read and you've known so much, I really want to know that how we can make household work quantifiable in nature so that we can add it in the GDP or if not, what is an alternative to it? You would like to answer that? I, I think you should. Okay. So they have done it. We have found ways now to quantify it. And that's why I gave you that uh, statistic uh, that, uh, has, that has been done. And uh, I think somebody spoke about uh, the uh, future of work. The World Economic Forum has done a study on the future of work and has identified certain sectors where the jobs are going to drop and certain sectors where they are going to rise, the sunrise sectors. And care work is one of the sunrise sectors where the jobs are going to increase. So, so what we are trying to say is that we have to look at how do we measure and value the domestic work, but also how do we do the public and private sector provision of that for everybody's benefit? Ma'am, but don't you think that there is a big difference between the public and private se sector at present? Because what I feel is a woman who might be discriminated in her private arena might look very confident and uh, leadership in a quantifiable manner outside. So she might be beaten up at home by her own husband, but would go and talk uh, about leadership and about a lot of good things and, you know, empowerment of women, though we don't need it, as already mentioned. Uh, so the public and the private sector are very different. We are not bringing it together, I feel. I think on a lighter note, the pandemic has taught men to do yes, housework. Yes, <laughs> yes. Hopefully, it really has. Hopefully they will go beyond Instagram. Instagram. Yes, yes. True, no, true. but you see here we are talking about private sector as in the uh, private sector of the economy, the companies, the corporates, the enterprises, private enterprise and public sector, government and so on and so forth. So that is the provisioning of care services. You know, we are referring to that. But you are right. Uh, you've brought up this other issue, which we have not today touched upon because there are, it's a whole universe of issues that relate to work. But today we, uh, we didn't touch upon this whole issue of violence against women and how that impedes uh, women's joining the workforce. You know, there are studies that UN Women has done, Susan, uh, that show how many uh, women hours are lost man hours are lost on account of violence against women and also how it then makes them uh, the leaking pipeline happens also because of violence so there is of course uh, you know sometimes women put up a brave front but and the reality may be different but that's why we have to visibilize make everything visible uh, in terms of where we are with some of these issues and each woman and that's my appeal to all women to be aware uh, to be uh, to express and also you know you referred to uh, you know every day do something everyday mutinies you know Gloria Steinheim's uh, uh, urging to every uh, young girl and and woman uh, you know, fight a million mutinies every day. But, you know, just wanted to tell her that, that I know you have a question on measuring housework and I know that it's going to take us a long time to go through the research. But since this is a book fest, I can tell you that there are two chapters in my book, Sisterhood Economy, you can go and check it out. Thank you so Thank much. You. And Thank those you of you who thought I was doing a sales pitch, I am doing one. <laughs> yes, down the frontier. Actually, Maybe we'll give it to the man first and come back.
thank you ma'am for the amazing session my question is that i have been working in corporate sector for 8 years and i find female managers far more discriminating towards uh, fe uh, females rather than their male counterparts there you are so uh, <laughs> how do you uh, how, like, what do you do to change that how do you how do you how do you so change the conversation i, yes, I don't uh, like i code they code i don't find a difference between the code but uh, i am not at a managerial position right now but i don't find a difference so i consider everyone like he or he also codes she also codes if she's a manager she's a manager but when it comes to giving favors like maternity leave they look at differently oh you are uh, having this advantage so you can go to a maternity leave this is a conversation which happened in front of me between two females yeah so no. yes mm -hmm. that was i have had women bosses and i have never had yeah. any discrimination ever you need One to see a conversation between but a male boss and a female yeah. subordinate. But in any case, in any case, there, there have been instances. And again, I will go back to my, uh, you know, her spirit is somewhere around us, Kamla Basim, where she said, uh, you know, gender is, uh, is not, you know, feminist, feminism and support for gender equality is not dependent on whether you are a man or woman. And she says that I've come across so many women and you have all this in, in Indian lore, you have this sas bahu thing. So women do the worst things to other women, not only in the sas bahu context, but even in the workplace. And, and I think there are many examples in my decades career. Most of the time I'm, I'm fine. But there have been some instances where I felt that, you know, if I had a male boss, he would have behaved differently. And, uh, you know, that perhaps uh, my female boss was a little more discriminatory than uh, a male boss. So, I think we have to really change that culture. And women have to show sisterhood, mentor other women. And... It, you, it should begin with each one of you. Whenever you begin your careers, start helping people yeah. as you go along, not kick the ladder. You know, women go climb the ladder and then kick it for other women. Thank you. So we're actually out of time, but maybe we can have your last question and, uh, and wrap up. Uh, should I get up? <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, I actually thought about this when you were talking about uh, the care economy. Um, the question that came to my mind was that how do you encourage women to speak up about sharing the burden when you're glorifying uh, the role of a working mother, you know, women who can have it all, women who do everything on their own. How do you encourage other women who maybe can't do everything on their own to talk about sharing the burden with their partners? Do you want to take that? Jacinda just did that. Yeah, um, yeah I think that's true. Like Jacinda, she said, just, Jacinda did just did that in one way. But I think the um, so there are lots of people here who look like they are... Uh, grappling with this question I think women need to stop budging and claiming that they want to do it all also yeah, yeah. and I'll be that person I've done this a few times that I I actually told my mom that I'm not listening to this argument that I have to get up and serve water when my brother could do it exactly. so I had to sit down and force myself to sit down even though somewhere in my heart my conditioning was like no no why don't you get up why yeah. don't you get up I said no I'm gonna stay chained to this chair Till this brother goes in with a tray and comes and serves the family. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a little bit of us to do it. Yes. And just to sort of mention this, because, you know, we are 50% of the population, but we raise the other half. Yeah. Can we get that part right too? Yeah. I think that's important as well. Yeah, yeah. And personally, I'd like to see a day where a male scientist is asked, so how much support did you get from your family? <laughs> <laughs> And also, you know, a man is never asked about work-life balance. Yes, exactly. It's only women. Exactly. Uh, we don't want balance, and yeah. We don't yeah, want that balance. Yeah. <laughs> so, I've lived with imbalance for years. 
and regrets and guilt, but oh, it's all, all okay. I don't regret in the end. I mean, the summation is, the balance sheet is okay. Um, and actually, I think it is really important to say that, um, that none of us can do it all, exactly. actually. And most of us with privilege have someone else in the house helping us that we need to acknowledge. And for my case, my husband is at home looking after our four girls so I can be here. So, <laughs> so you know, there is change. And I think that, you know, we, we thank you very much, everyone on the panel. It's been such a fascinating conversation. And I've loved some of the points of slight disagreement as well, you know. Um, and we need more robust conversations about this, I think, between us, because the change starts here as well as the big policy changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Audiences, please give them a big round of applause as a token of appreciation to all four distinguished members of the panel, Shelly Chopra, Mini Vaid, Lakshmi.